right now. Waste management open, um, taking place. Uh, last I saw, Scotty Scheffler had the lead. Let me note, Scotty Scheffler loves Jesus, so give it up for that, right? So I like that. So uh, not that God cares about golf or anything, right? But uh, uh, and then there's something else going on uh, today. What is what's going on? Um, oh, that's what it is. Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, you know, Glendale hosting the Super Bowl. What is it? Fifty-seven. Two quarterbacks who both love Jesus. Come on, give it up. Uh, does God call about care about the game? No, but does He love the quarterbacks? You better believe it, right? So. Um, what else is going on? Phoenix Suns, big trade. I don't agree with it, but you know, the eyes of the world are like, look, what this Phoenix Suns doing? Kevin Durant for half our good team, you know, whatever. Um, but here's the thing, you know, all this attention, right? I'm watching the news and you know, it's all about the red carpet. Who's famous in town? DJ Khaled, Jill Biden, whatever. You know, I just sit there and I, I, I want us to keep things in perspective because I, I like to do that. You know what really matters is not who's in town right now, but who's on the throne. Amen. Who's on the throne? And while the eyes of the world may be on Phoenix, you know where the eyes of heaven are right now? Right here. You know what? what's most important in time and eternity is not what's taking place on a golf course in North Scottsdale. It's what's going on right here. You know what's really important is not what's going to go on in a stadium with tens of thousands of people in a few hours, but what's going on right here? You know what shakes the corridors of the kingdom? Is when the people of God gather to worship the king. That's what matters. And I think we get all like caught up in the hype. And like, oh man, the Super Bowl. And, and, and again, I love sports. And some of you are like, Super Bowl, I can't wait for a lot of baskets to be scored. I know how much you're into sports as well. But we all, you know, we love com competition, and there's nothing wrong with those things. But isn't it just like our, our culture and our society to focus on celebrities and all these events and really miss out on what's ultimately important? You are the most important person to the Lord. His work in, in the church is what's most important in this world. Don't let anything ever take that from you. As much hype as, as, as things are you know, being produced, and I'm excited for all the, the billions of dollars of revenue that the state's going to earn, you know? What does it profit us if we get so excited about our football time, team and we lose sight of our soul in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? What does it profit us if we, if we come and we scream louder for our favorite team and we're not even shouting out to the King of Kings who's going to reign forever? What, what does that say about us? And I'm not here to be that, I'm not Debbie Downer or Donald Downer, whatever you want to call me. Like, I don't want to be that guy, but I also want us to keep things in perspective. Because there are things that we should be so energetic for and so zealous for and so excited for. And let me just tell you, in my world, that is not a football team and that's not a golf player and that's not some celebrity. That's Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about today. How's that sound? So we get to talk about the king and the kingdom because nothing is more important than that. So turn your Bibles to Acts 17. Uh, we're going to look at this, this passage because you see Paul here, and this is what really gets him motivated and excited. And uh, this guy is just filled with energy, and, and, and we know where it comes from. I mean, this is a guy who's getting beat up for Jesus, and he is spending sleepless nights in prison and being beaten up and bloodied, and he's walking hundreds of miles for people to know Jesus Christ. And I think we can learn a lot from Paul, and I think we can learn a lot from the passage today. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. Uh, Acts chapter 17 is where we're going to be. And if you remember last week, Paul and Silas were the guys holding a worship service in prison, right? And they were the ones that were just like, you know what? Yeah, we can be beat up for Jesus, but nothing's going to rob us of the song that we have in Christ. And, you know, the world may not like what we have to say, but Christ compels us to tell people about his love. And for, for Paul and Silas and his team, there's nothing more important. And we see that as they continue doing what they're doing, even with all the affliction and even all the, the beatings and all the imprisonments. So we turn to Acts 17, and Paul and, and Silas have left Philippi where we were last week, and they left on their own terms, which I love. Paul's probably a hard guy to get along with, 
and he demanded a public apology because they were uh, imprisoned um, unfairly. They were not given the, 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 the due process uh, that was theirs as Roman citizens. So uh, the, the, the leaders wanted him to get out of town in the middle of the night and have it be a hush-hush deal. And Paul's like, nope. You're going to publicly apologize, and we'll leave town when we feel like it. So they go to Lydia's house. They have a big Bible study, and then they eventually get on the road, and they travel 100 miles by foot to get to the next city called Thessalonica. And uh, now, mind you, these guys have not slept. They've been beaten like crazy. They're bloodied like you wouldn't believe, and they walk 100 miles to the next city so they can tell more people about Jesus. That convicts me. I mean, sometimes I won't want to walk 100 yards to tell someone about Jesus. These guys are willing to go 100 miles, sleep-deprived, trauma-filled, experiencing pain like you and I would never, ever experience before. And they go to this town called Thessalonica. It's 200,000 people, wealthy city, influential city. It's got its shares of sins and vices and, and issues. But Paul was dead set to find people there that wanted to talk about spiritual things in the hopes of introducing Jesus into the conversation. And just like last week, I'm just going to give you guys a little heads up. Just like last week when Paul was in Philippi, he writes a letter called Philippians to the Philipp church at Philippi. Today, we're going to kind of interweave some of Thessalonians because this is where he writes to the Thessalonian church and encourages them. He writes two letters to the Thessalonians. Guess what they're called? First and second Thessalonians. Imagine that. He's so creative. He writes two letters. First letters, five chapters. Second letters, three chapters. I want to encourage you to do this this week is read those letters as a complement to what we're going to talk about today. So they're in the New Testament, uh, First and Second Thessalonians, because the things he touches on there are the things we're going to kind of introduce this morning. So turn to Acts 16, and Paul and Silas and the team go to Thessalonica. Uh, this would be the earliest writings for Paul, too. His letters to the Thessalonica, uh, Thessalonians would be his first writings uh, to, the, to the churches gathered. And so... Um, this is really, really cool. So check out chapter 17 of Acts, verse 1. Let's read the passage, and I'm going to talk about three important points we see here when it comes to the king and the kingdom. Verse 1, so now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and uh, 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 Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. So they travel 30 miles to this one city. They, they, we don't know what they do there, if anything. They continue on to the next city. Ultimately, their destination is Thessalonica. I think Paul operated best in much more uh, metropolitan, bigger city centers. So that's why I think they beelined it to Thessalonica. And there they found a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went into the synagogue and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining, giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again for the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ or is the Messiah. And just like we've seen in the, in the past, some people respond favorably and some people don't respond favorably to the message of Jesus being the Christ, right? Verse 4, some of them were persuaded, joined Paul and Silas along with a great multitude of God-fearing Greeks and a number of leading women. Go ladies, right? This is awesome. So the Jews, some Greeks, some prominent women in the community all embraced Jesus but some of the Jews, they became jealous, taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, meaning they hired some thugs from town that needed some work. Um, we'll call it Occupy Thessalonica. This is the first Occupy movement ever to take place, right? So there they are. They form a mob, set the city in an uproar, coming to the house of Jason, who was probably an early convert in the city. They were seeking to bring Paul and Silas out to the people because they didn't like the message, right? And when they did not find Paul and Silas at the house— they take Jason and those other brothers uh, and sisters before the authorities, and they shout. Notice what they shout. These men have come to turn our world upside down. Circle that phrase, because that is an amazing accusation. It's, it is a beautiful truth that we're going to spend a little bit of time on here in a bit. But these men have come here to turn our world upside down, which actually is not far from the truth. And Jason has welcomed them and offered them a place to stay. And he has acted contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, and his name is Jesus. 
And they stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received the pledge from Jason, so obviously he posted some sort of money guaranteeing that Paul and Silas would not come back to town. They released them. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. You guys ready to have some fun? Here we go. First point is this. There's an openness to the king. So we see this right off the bat, uh, verse 1, 2, 3, 4. So all Paul wanted to preach was Jesus. And let me just tell you that there's no other message but Jesus, you guys. Let's not complicate this. Let's keep this simple. This is why G Paul would write in other places. We proclaim Jesus as Lord and Lord alone. We're going to preach Jesus and him crucified. Let me just tell you right now, it doesn't get any more difficult than that. Just talk about Jesus. This was Paul's, uh, this was his MO, this was his motivation, this was his love, this was his enthusiasm. And so wherever he went, he was going to point people to Christ, because ultimately that's all that matters, is, is, is Jesus. And notice what he does here, verse 1. He does what he always does when there is a city big enough to have a synagogue, which was the, the gathering of Jewish people, but also there were also God-fearing Greeks who were non-Jews who were interested in the, in the God of the Old Testament or the God of the Jews— they would gather, and so if a city had a synagogue, Paul beelined it to the synagogue, which begin, this, this is why this is important. Point number one is he starts with the spiritual. So what you're going to see is you're going to see this, this style of Paul that I think ought to be our style today, and that is we should start by engaging people who are already spiritually sensitive. Some might even call them spiritually seeking. I'm not crazy about it, but you know what? Nonetheless, here's what I would, I would tell you. Most people are spiritually open. Most people want to talk about spiritual things. Rare is the person that's totally closed off to it. Because we're spiritual creatures, people are open to have spiritual conversations. And so Paul goes, I want to go to a city and find those where spirituality is already on their radar. Well, what better place to go to than the synagogue where Jews and God-fearing Greeks have gathered to open the Old Testament. 39 books of the Bible, history, wisdom, prophecy. They're already opening them, so let's start with those who are already open to spiritual things. Think about the people in your life. Think about the people you interact with. There are people that are already open spiritually. My prayer is that you would start with them. What does he do next? Then he, once he starts with the spiritual, then he starts with the scripture. There are people who already have an understanding of the word. There are people who are open to the word. Uh, it's interesting as we live in our Christ-haunted culture, and that's what I would describe as the American culture, there's this presence of Jesus among us. There's this presence of, of, of biblical truth around us, even though we don't necessarily know it personally. Most people don't know it personally. People would say we're founded on a Judeo-Christian worldview. Our nation's founded by, by Christians or God-fearing people. It's, it's out there, right? Well, here's the opportunity for us to, to start with the scriptures and talk about these things. I remember a day, and this is how old I am, and I know some of you are like, you're not old. I remember at the end of the day, the, the, the TV networks would go off the air, and they would close with a Bible verse. You guys remember those days? And, and the Bible verse was usually, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And then it went, beep, and you're like, it's time for bed. Okay, let's go to sleep, right? Some of you are like, boy, those were the days when TV actually came to an end, and you had to go to bed, and you couldn't binge watch whatever in, during the evening, right? So, uh, there's this interesting presence of spiritual things already among us. So Paul would, so he would start with the spiritual, then he would start with the scriptures. But then third, and we're going to unpack this third point, he starts with strategy. So here's where I'm going to put a little bit more application to what we've already talked about. So he seeks those who are already open spiritually. He, t he goes to those who are, have some knowledge of the word. Now he's got a strategy, and it's a four-pronged approach that I think will encourage you in your own walk. I think it will encourage you as you talk to people about spiritual things. Paul employs a four-pronged approach that I think we can learn from, and here they are. Number one, look what he does as far as this effective strategy in reaching people with the gospel. Number one, he engages. Look what it says in, in, in verse, uh, uh, verse two. It says, and according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths, now here's the good news, 
Rarely is someone changed like that. It took him three Sabbaths to finally see some sort of movement and traction, right? Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Please be patient with people, right? People need time. I love the fact that God, it doesn't say, and then Paul guilt tripped them or Paul, you know, twisted their arm behind their back and made them choose Jesus, right? Like, you got to allow people move, room to move and to think and to process things. And, and if God's going to do the work, he's going to do the work. And all he wants for you to do is be faithful and to be patient. So for three Sabbaths, he, he reasons with them. Number one, what does that mean? He didn't deliver a sermon. He engages in a dialogue. I love this because this is the Socratic method of learning where you come to the table and you ask questions. And you have this back and forth, civil, respectful dialogue, which unfortunately is being, it's going more and more extinct in our culture. But man, we need to become conversationalist. We need to become, and that's not another denomination. Some of you are like, is that a denomination? No, it's not a denomination. I'm part of the conversationalist, you know, movement of Christianity, right? But we do need to engage people. People don't want you coming with a sermon. They don't want you coming in and being like, well, this is what you need to believe, boom, and you leave. No, people want to have interaction. And I love how Paul respectfully, cordially, graciously engages people in conversation. And so, number one, ask good questions. Get ready for a, a, a good dialogue. Whether you all agree or don't, don't agree, it's okay because there needs to be an exchange of ideas, questions, answers. And, and then what he does is then he begins to bring up some Old Testament food for thought. Because the, the Jews are already open the, the, the scriptures, right? So what he does next is really, really good. And this is he explains. So it says in the text that he reasons with them and then he explains or opens up the scripture. This is the same idea that we find in Luke chapter 24 when the two disciples on the road to Emmaus meet the risen Jesus, even though they don't know it's Jesus, and they're totally sad because they realize, like, Jesus has been crucified and all our hopes of a Messiah are, are dashed. And then the person with them, who's Jesus, begins to share with them the Old Testament. And it says their hearts were open, and then they realized, that's Jesus with us, and then he disappears. And I'm going to tell you right now that this is what the Word of God does. It opens our hearts. This is what we get to do on every Sunday. So people go, Pastor, what do you do? Because, you know, the, the, the assumption is Pastor only works on Sunday, and then the rest of the time I play golf or binge watch Netflix or something like that, right? But here's the thing. I get the privilege on Sunday to explain the Word. This is what we're doing right now. We've opened the scriptures, and I get the opportunity to explain the word to you. Now, here's where the pressure's off of me, how open and how responsive you are to the word that's opened. See, there was a day, and there still might be a tinge of it today, where I get a little bit like, I want you to believe this so bad, and I'm willing to like bl sweat blood for you to believe it, but then God goes, easy, Scott. Let me do the work that only I can do internally. And here's the promise. Isaiah 55, when the word is sent, it doesn't come back empty or void. All, I, all God says for me to do is open the word, explain the word, and let the spirit do what only the spirit do, does. And that's called illumination. It brings to understanding our hearts that only God can orchestrate and, and do. And so here's what Paul does. He says, let's talk about some of the scripture. May, he may have taken the text that morning in the synagogue. Oh, you guys are talking about Isaiah 53. Let's talk about Isaiah 53. And he begins to explain to them through scripture what's going on. We get to do this every Sunday. Is that awesome that we get to open the word together? We got to sing. We get to see each other. But I would say the central part of what we do on Sundays is we open up God's inspired word. This is his very voice. This is his very heart given to us so that we can leave changed people because we've heard him tell us things. We've heard him instruct us in things. We've heard him encourage us in things. And so he, he, he takes the word and he opens it up. And let me just tell you, he does it with, with clarity and simplicity. Now, I, 
I'm one of those guys that sometimes I find it, I'll use these big words, and I sit there and go, why did I say, I sound stupid. I, I sound like my seminary education is like been, being paid off right in front of your very eyes every single Sunday, right? But yet, if I don't make it clear and simple, what have I done to encourage you, right? And, and I may come off looking all fancy, like, hey, let's talk about super lapsarianism. And some of you are like, what, what? That doesn't matter, right? Jesus taught in ways even children couldn't understand what he was saying. And so I think Paul comes in, and while he doesn't depend on human reasoning, nor does he lean on, you know, sentimental emotionalism, he appeals to the heart and the conscience, but he does it through the mind. And I want to just tell you that we're not going to dumb it down so much so that we appear anti-intellectual, because I think there is this, this, this spirit of Christianity among us where people are like, you Christians don't know how to have a conversation. You don't know how to argue. You don't know how to debate, whatever it may be. And I do think there's this anti-intellectualism that's creeped into the church. I'm going to tell you right now, we're not going to put all the cookies on the bottom shelf. We, we need to stretch all of our thinking. We need to, we need to challenge one another. This is why, probably why I love C.S. Lewis a lot is because he appeals to the imagination, he appeals to the intellect, but he does it in a clear and simple way. Here's he, he's this, he's this, you know, a professor at Cambridge and professor at Oxford, and yet when he says a certain quote and sums up a certain spiritual thought, you're like, that's awesome, I get that, even my five-year-old could, well, when they were five, they could understand that. And so I think for us as as believers to to not lose sight of that, now my notes are all over the floor, right? So, um, but I love C.S. Lewis for that very reason. So some of you are like, he loves C.S. Lewis so much so he talks about Lewis more than his wife. Well, I, that might be true. I don't know. I just, it is what it is. So a third point. So, so there's, there's, the, there's the engaging. There's the explaining. Then there's the evidences. So it says right here in, in the verse that he reasons with them. So there's a conversation, a dialogue. Then there's the opportunity to say, hey, what are you guys studying? And then he opens up the, the word, and then he gives evidence. And what I love about this third point here is that it's not only diving deeper into the Old Testament, but it's also combining what the word says with your own personal experiences. And if you know anything about Paul, he met the risen Christ in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus. He, he goes from being the most persecutorial man against the church to the most promoting man for the church only god can do that kind of miracle in in someone's life and so i think what he does here is he takes the scriptures he takes his own personal testimony and then he really combines those two things and says let me let me tell you how this plays out in my life and and let me just say just for for just this is so important the old testament contains the the plan of God for everybody, right? My question to you as a church, right, if if we think about the Old Testament, for some of you who are unaware of the Bible, it's comprised of two two parts. There's the Old Testament, there's the New Testament. The Old Testament is two-thirds of our Bible. My question to you is this, could you point someone to Jesus just using the Old Testament without using the New Testament? Because this is what Paul does. And yet, there are some among us, and not saying necessarily in this room, influential pastors that have recently come out and said, you need to unhitch your life from the Old Testament because it's actually preventing people from coming to know Jesus. And these are mega, this is a mega church pastor out of Georgia ministering to tens of thousands of people who has publicly come out and said the Old Testament is actually hindering the work of God. And I'm sitting there going, are you kidding me? Right? Yeah, see yourself out. But yet this person's selling out books like crazy and podcasts like crazy. And I, and I just have to just tell you that what Paul does here is so important because we can't just dismiss two-thirds of our Bible. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, you see Jesus on every page. I would tell you, you see Jesus in every, every chapter. I would, I would tell you that I have in front of you an incredible document, and I'm old school because I printed it off, and I, I do have an electronic copy of this, and some of you are going to want to have this after I describe this to you. What this is, is this is three pages of Old Testament scriptures that point to the person and work of Christ. The prophecies contained in the Old Testament that point to their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. Now, let me just tell you, there are hundreds on here 
And this is why I could tell you Christ is found on every page of the Old Testament. He's found in every, every chapter of the, of the Bible. This is why Paul goes to the Jews and says, you guys are looking at uh, Psalm 22. Don't you know that tell, tells us about the crucifixion of Christ? And, 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 and Isaiah 53, the suffering servant passage, where Jesus is the, the surf, suffering servant, and through by his stripes we are healed. And, and if you think that Christ is only crucified, well, it also speaks of the resurrection. Turn to Psalm 16. Where in Psalm 16, the psalmist writes, and you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. And, and there are hundreds of passages that Paul can lean on with his audience and say, Look how this points to Jesus. Look how this is connected to Jesus. And so with this, there are hundreds of prophecies, Old Testament reference, New Testament fulfillment, page after page after page. I have prophecies concerning his birth. I have prophecies concerning his nature. I have prophecies concerning his ministry. I have prophecies concerning events after his burial. I have prophecies that are fulfilled in even one day of Jesus' life right here. We need the Old Testament. It is, it is God's, it's his promises that are fulfilled, yes, and amen, in Christ. This is, this is why this sets this book apart. We're not here on Sunday mornings having a book club meeting. This is not Oprah's book. Well, what's the book of choice? It's the Bible. We've well, been in the Bible for a long time. Yeah, it's a big book, right? right? We're not here. This is not book club. This is a chance for us to open the word, for me to explain it to you, and for us to see the evidences of God's handiwork over this supernatural book given to us. The, it is miraculous to think that what has changed the world, what's turned the world upside down, is the biblical explanation of Scripture, the Christ-centric focus of the Word of God. What's going to change our world? The Word of God's going to change our world. This is why we can't forsake the teaching of the Word. And this is why your pastor only works one day a week. <laughs> I'm just, just kidding with you. Real quick, in case you're interested, for Christ to fulfill eight prophecies, so if I took eight of these hundreds of prophecies, the likelihood of even just fulfilling eight prophecies, the likelihood of that happening is like taking a silver dollar, marking it with a big black X, dropping it in the state of Texas, and then filling the state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars, me putting you in an airplane, blindfolding you 30,000 feet, pushing you into the state of Texas, you have one pick, and for you to pick that one silver dollar with the X on it, that's the likelihood of any one person fulfilling eight prophecies found in the, New, in the Old Testament. Some of you are like, <laughs> it requires eight shots of espresso just to explain that to you. It is remarkable. Even skeptics, even those that are antagonistic to Christianity, admit to the miraculous nature of these prophecies being fulfilled in Christ. Now you combine that with men and women's lives who have been changed by this. That's called evidence. That's called evidence. And here we are, men and women who have been transformed by this message. In the Old Testament and the New Testament combined for one message. God has a plan to send a Redeemer to die for sinners in order for us to be reconciled to Him. There's the message of Scripture. And the hero of the Bible has always been Jesus. And the hero of the message from this point forward will always be Jesus. There will never be a Sunday we gather where the hero is never going to be Jesus. For Paul to let this group of men and women know this, there's no other message. I will preach Christ and him crucified. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We don't have the verse up there, but you can write it down. He says, we are not going to talk about ourselves, but we're going to talk about Jesus as Lord because that's all that matters. You read that this morning? Lucky. Okay, quit bragging. Okay. So, and then last, and here's the, so he, he engages, he explains, he gives evidence. And then the fourth thing he encourages. Notice how he closes out verse 3. And he says to the group, that's why I'm here to proclaim to you that Jesus is the Christ, or he is the Messiah. He's the one that's been promised to us 
from the very beginning. And you, you ultimately have to call someone to a point of decision. You ultimately have to say, what does all this mean? Do you believe it? Do you accept it? Because it's one thing to just have it hang up here in the intellectual s- sphere of who you are, but it's another thing to allow that mind to impact your heart and say, if he is the king, if he's the anointed one, that's got to do something radical on my life. Because God doesn't want to give just have you give him intellectual assent. We're not here preaching about facts. We're here to present facts. We're here to share with every single person the gospel and say this has to mean something. And I'm going to tell you what it means. It changes the the meaning of life, the origin of your life, the purpose of your life, your destiny, all those things. And so, and what happens? People change. Men, women come to know Jesus. Some of the Jews believe. Some of the God-fearing Greeks believe. Prominent women of the city believe. Which reminds us, the gospel's for everybody. Employed, unemployed, black, white, male, female, it doesn't matter. The gospel is for everybody. But let me add something right here, too, for you, because I think this is important. Because here's what I've, 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 laid, I've laid on you. This, this idea that, how do I practice this? You're, you're telling me Paul has this strategy. What does that look like in my life? What does that look like in your life? Well, here's what Paul does. If you notice, he's in town for at least three Sabbaths. What did he do in between? Did he hit the the golf course at Thessalonica? Because I hear they got a really epic golf course there. (laughs) Did he just kind of hang out at the local cafe? You know, that cup of coffee in Thessalonica, there's nothing like it. You know what he did while he was in Thessalonica? Let me let you in on a little bit. First Thessalonians. Look what he says in chapter 2, verses uh, let's go to verses 9 through 12, Debbie. Let's do that because I've skipped a lot. But First Thessalonians, check this out. So he's writing to the Thessalonican church that he started. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil, we work day and night that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. So let's stop right there. Working day and night goes beyond just the Sabbath. You know what Paul and Silas did while they were in town in between ministering to people through the word? They worked. And guess what they did as far as their job? Tent making. This is awesome. So these guys were tent. They had a vocation that they were able to put their hands to in order to not be a burden financially in the church, but to pay their own way. And you better believe where they were tent making they were also having conversations with people. They're, they're sewing away and making those tents and like, what do you got over there? A four dome person tent? Okay, well, how's that going? And then they're talking about Jesus as they're working, which tells me something, which tells me that every single one of us, no matter where we go, we are all ambassadors for Jesus. Matter of fact, I want you to understand something so important that this is part of the model of what we've tried to start here with the Sozo Missio Dei model coffee house church, is that there's this idea of missional living that God wants for every single one of us, meaning this. Ministry happens every single day all around us with, with everybody we meet. The fact is this, you may be out there as a carpenter, you may be a banker, you may be a seamstress, you may be uh, in real estate, you may be a sports star, you may be a celebrity of some you know, level. But here's the reality of it, is that every single one of us are existing in a community and culture among people who don't know Jesus, and God wants you to be salt and light with all those people. This is called missional living. The work of ministry is not just for the pastor or El Jefe, as you like to call me. I mean, I call myself that, I guess. But um, here's the thing. You are also ministers in the household of God. You're ambassadors of the Most High. Matter of fact, Ephesians chapter 4 is one of those prayers that I pray for you and that we as a church, and even coming up in a few months, and I won't disclose anything now, but... 
Ephesians chapter 4 says this, we are responsible as leaders to equip and mobilize you as the saints to do the work of ministry. Now you want to know the really, really, really good news in all this? Is that God looks for normal people doing normal things with gospel intentionality. Matter of fact, write that phrase down, gospel intentionality. Because here's what I'm personally, here's my personal revolution. <laughs> I want us to minimize ministry to just Sunday mornings for an hour and a half and maximize ministry Monday through Saturday wherever God has us. And that's something you don't hear the church say. We don't have the church moving people in this direction. What excites me more is not this. This is exciting, but what excites me more is to hear how you, being a normal person, doing normal work, has this gospel intentional heartbeat for your surroundings, your neighborhood, your coworkers. See, this is what Paul's living out here. He's saying, I am living and I'm working and I'm toiling and I'm laboring day and night so that I don't want to be a burden on the church, but we're going to proclaim to you the gospel of God. And now notice this, what he says, you are witnesses and God also how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. Meaning, I don't want you just to see my life when we're together on a Sunday. I want you to see my life on a Wednesday night with my family. I want to see your life when it comes to where you're working on Thursday morning because your spirituality doesn't only exist on Sunday. Who you are in Christ doesn't just fit into an hour and a half service when we gather on Sundays. Who you are in Christ ought to permeate and influence every sphere of your life, whether at work, at play, at home, with wife, with neighbor, with coworkers, whatever, who you are as salt and light in Christ matters. So much so, for you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So you see the heart of Paul with this church. He's saying, I, I've lived among you. I was just sharing with someone uh, after first service that when we started Sozo Missio Day, I worked four jobs. My kids were totally confused about what their dad did for work. So I, uh, I was planting a church. I was a coffee dude. I worked for FedEx, and I also cleaned pools for my, my father-in-law. So I had four jobs. So people were like, so what does your dad do? And my kids would be like, he's like a coffee FedEx pool cleaning pastor guy. And people were like, we don't know what that means, but that sounds really epic, right? And, and, and what it was was that God had me involved in four different spheres of work. So number one, I could provide for my family. But number two was that so I could live out what I'm preaching to you this very day. That when I was at FedEx, that I was trying to be salt and light in a context that didn't want to be salt, <laughs> didn't want salt and light. Right? Any, any place you go to that doesn't want Christ is, is opposed to... Th I'm not saying FedEx was, a, a, was so anti, but when you go to your workplace, you just get the sense like people don't want to talk about Jesus here. People don't want God here, right? But, but you know what? You start living your life in such a manner, people are like, hey, there's something different about you. There's something... I'm curious. What, 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 what makes you tick? What do you believe in, right? And there are opportunities for me at FedEx to share with people, and I remember one instance, this guy, really, really curious, wanting to talk more about these things, and I'm thinking, like, we're on the clock, like, I don't want, this is, this is not, like, my, jo I want to honor the company, and, but I gave him a copy of uh, jo uh, Josh Carp, Josh uh, McDowell's More Than a Carpenter, he read it, the next day, he's like, just so you know, last night, I accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, this is a guy I work with, on, like, unloading trucks, right, and all of a sudden, the next day, and to this day, this was eight years ago, to this day, he does, he's not necessarily a part of our church, but he financially supports our church. He gives, and he, just, he messages me once in a while and just says, hey, just want you to know God's just continuing to work in my life. And I, I love that. And I, and I didn't go in there going, hey, guys, guess what? The pastor's here. Like, you know, like, 
I was just a normal dude doing a normal job, living a normal life, but with gospel intentionality. And I'm just going to encourage you as a church. God wants you to be effective on the front lines wherever he has you. Don't, don't be like, oh man, if only my neighbor met my pastor and then, you know, things. No, no, no. I don't want to meet your neighbor. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this out of uh, unkindness, but I'm saying I'm not going to do anything that you can't do already. Matter of fact, you've got more gravity in that relationship than I could ever have. Don't minimize the, the role you play in a person's life. Because you're able to do the same things I'm able to do. Do you know Jesus? Are you able to talk about Jesus? Are you able to maybe come up with a few verses to kind of throw into a conversation as you're engaging in this dialogue? Normal people doing normal work with gospel intentionality. This is what God wants. This is what God wants. And, and, and I think we see it. I think we see it here with what Paul says to this church. Like, don't forget that he's equipped you with the very things he's equipped me with. Be salt and be light. But again, people don't always respond favorably to the message, right? Point number two, we'll go through this real quick. So there's opposition to the king, obviously. People want to do what they want to do. Let's just be honest. We don't want to be submissive to another authority. We think we're good with our, being our own authority. How's that working out for you, you know, right? So there's some in verse 5, it says, and they were jealous and they were angry. And let's just be honest. These guys were bringing a message that most people don't want to hear. There's a, there's a king and there's a kingdom that demands rule and he's inviting us into this and, and if we don't submit, um, it's, it's not going to turn out well. And so there's opposition to the king and, and Paul dealt with opposition every place he went. And to think that we're immune to opposition, let me just tell you, it's going to come. People aren't going to like what you say. They're not going to like what you, you tell them. You're not, they're gonna like. That's not with you. That, they're taking a beef up with God. Unfortunately, the messenger <laughs> tends to be the one that's attacked. But let me just encourage you to keep going because the, wor- the world around us, is, is, it's crumbling. If you think about this just past week, I read of two cities, Portland and Amsterdam, that are, are crumbling and people are going, what can we do to save our communities? Because here's what they've done. They've said, we're opposed to anything that would allow people to flourish and be healthy. And instead, we've embraced laws and policies that allow everyone to kind of do whatever they want to do. But at what point do people overrun each other and destroy one another? Portland is falling apart because they, in their open-mindedness said, let's just let everyone do whatever they want to do. Well, there comes a point when worldviews collide and collapse. And we're seeing that. And now they're scrambling on how do we restore our city? <gasps> oh, now we're open to seeing what it means to not be so self-absorbed, but be a self-others focus and to, and to flourish. And I believe God wants communities to flourish, but they're not going to flourish if they're doing things contrary to his will. Now, I'm not saying they need some sort of Christian worldview, but you cannot in, uh, subscribe to liberal ideologies and smoke and drink and have sex and do this or that with anyone and whoever you like and not think that there's gonna, not going to be consequences to this. Amsterdam is revisiting their cannabis laws. Because as they're, yeah, at one point they were like the poster child, like, look at this city, red light district, pot smoking, coffee houses, who wouldn't want this? And now the city, the city is complaining, no, don't worry, I'm not getting any new ideas for business ventures here. I mean, maybe, but uh, the, the residents of Amsterdam are pressing the city to come up with new laws regarding red light districts and cannabis smoking because now people can't sleep because of all the carousing that's going on at 3 in the morning. Well, I thought you were so open-minded and liberal. Like, you thought, oh, this is going to be great until it starts affecting your sleep. (laughs) Right? And, And again, people can do whatever they want. And there's cities and there's cultures that will pass laws to, oh, yeah, come here. You can just embrace whatever lifestyle you want. That only works so long and goes so far until we realize, number one, none of these things will feed that hunger you have for something deeper 
they, they'll give you what you want off the, uh, at the start, but it's going to leave you with dissatisfaction. Because every longing of the human heart ultimately has to be satisfied in God. Because if you look for some other substitute, it's not going to be there. And we see these cities crumbling. Why? Because they're trying to live their lives apart from the king who has come to says, and says, I, I've come to give you life and life abundantly. I've come to be the way, the truth, and the life. But yet, if you disregard me, where are you going to go for the words of eternal life? They're found in Christ. Which brings me to my third point, and, and this is where I'll preach a little bit and we'll, we'll be done. And in and, 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 and reality, this is where we even get to talk about even Rochelle's memorial. We're going to be doing Rochelle Coker's memorial here at 1 o'clock today. This is what I'm going to encourage people with. There are going to be people here who don't know Christ, who know her, but we want to point to the hope that Rochelle had. You know, who understands these things more than any of us could ever understand them right now. She's experiencing Christ in his full splendor and majesty and glory. And, oh, but here's the last point, overturning of the king. God has to overturn our lives. Right? This is the mission of Jesus. Because if you look at verse 6, it says, these men have come into our city and they've, oh, they've turned our world upside down. And they say that as if it's a bad thing. I'm going to tell you right now, that's one of the glorious, most glorious accolades that could ever be given to the church. That, yeah, we are here to turn the world upside down. Because you know what sin did back in the garden in Genesis chapter 3? It took the things of God and it turned the world upside down. And now we've grown accustomed to this upside down living. And we think it's normal and we think it's right. But we all know deep down in our spirits that the world is not the way it ought to be. I mean, think about great stories like The Matrix. I mean, there's a reason why Neo's story resonates with us because it's like, <gasps> there is a matrix. I'm going to tell you right now, there is a matrix. And it's called Jesus and it's called the kingdom. And until we plug into him, we're going to be living this kind of false reality, thinking it's true reality, when in reality, the only true reality lies in him who's the king. Think about stranger things. Isn't there this realm called the upside down? Was this stranger things also dabbling in this idea? <gasps> there are realms that we don't necessarily know and we haven't tapped into. All this is the world's way of saying there is something unknown that is more real than what is known. And so in a way, the charge against the church is a charge that ought to be present in us even today. Are we men and women turning the world upside down? Because here's where I'm really disappointed. The church isn't doing that. There's no one out there saying, those Christians are turning the world upside down. You want to know why? Because we haven't embraced a countercultural lifestyle. We've just looked like our neighbor and everybody else, and we do the same thing they do, and we do it without this passion and zeal for the king or his kingdom. We, we've, really, we've become ineffective. And guess what? I don't want to sit by and just allow that to continue. I'm just going to yell at you guys for a few minutes, so if you don't mind me a chance to do that. Let me, let me tell you two things, and this is so important. What we do preach is that there is an upside-down kingdom. There is this sense that God is, even today, making things right, right? We, we need to let people know that our normal course of living is not the way it should be. He has come into our lives to turn us upside-down. He is truly a countercultural king who brings this message saying, the first shall be, and the rich shall be, right? These are not things that we just like, oh yeah, like the world says, no, be number one and go and work and accumulate all these riches. And Jesus says, give it all up. The greatest sermon ever preached, Matthew 5, 6, 7, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. It is all about countercultural living. Forgiveness, revenge, lust, adultery, finances, praying. Like, that's our lives. And Jesus says, as you approach these normal things, look at them through the eyes of having a new authority over your life. Ladies and gentlemen, there is an upside down kingdom that's happening, but it doesn't come first without this, the inside out king. And I close with this, because I think our churches have turned into these 
gatherings where, you know, I've got eight steps to make my marriage better or five steps to make my financial house in order or, you know, 10 ways I can make my prayer life better. And all those things are good. But if we only talk about morality and ethics and, and, and behavior and we don't get at the heart, which I think is at the heart of not have, being accused of turning the world upside down, is because we haven't come in contact with the king who desires to turn your life inside out. Before you can be a part of the upside down kingdom, he must do work on your hearts. You don't want the kingdom without first having the king. Because when you have the kingdom and you don't have the king, that kingdom will destroy you. But when you have the king and then you get the kingdom with the king, it doesn't lead to destruction, it leads to delight. We've embraced a toothless, banal, boring form of Christianity that is unimpressive to the world. We've we've really uh, emasculated uh, our Jesus. We've pulled every tooth from his mouth. We've made him into this palatable deity that drives around in a convertible in the sunshine, listens to T-Swift or whatever. I mean, whatever we've done to Jesus, we haven't come in contact with the king who destroys our lives in order to build us up again, in order to show us that his, his rulership, his authority, is better than anything you and I could ever chase or pursue or want in our lives. Amen. I want you to taste and see that the Lord is good. And I want your life to now be that under a new leader, under a new authority, so much so that your neighbors and your family members and your coworkers are taking note and saying, what makes you different? Your br- the way you talk to your wife is different than the way that guy talks to his wife. And the way you spend your money is different than, see, the problem is we look too much like our culture because we're chasing all the same things our culture does. We're not living with eternity in view. We don't understand what it means to have our citizenship in heaven. Christ has come not to bring a political kingdom. He's come to bring a spiritual kingdom. And that kingdom is breaking into our lives as we speak right now. I would do you a disservice if I didn't invite you to, to, to come under his reign and rule. Because while he is the lamb of God slain for our sins, we praise God for that, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah and the king who reigns right now at the right hand of the Father. And he wants your heart to have allegiance to him and him alone. And when he becomes your treasure and your delight and you taste and see that the Lord is good, you live as citizens of another kingdom. You don't fear and tremble at the things that the world is fearing and trembling, right? Think about it. Two weeks ago, the doomsday clock was moved 90 seconds closer to midnight. Now, some of you are like, what is he talking about? Well, for for decades, there's been this thing called the doomsday clock, and it's set by atomic scientists. And they look at what's going on in the world, and it's closer to midnight than it's ever been. Because once it hits midnight, that's total global destruction. So I know all of you are like, oh, I can't wait to tune in to hear about how it's all going to crumble and fall apart. Well, they've moved it closest it's ever been, 90 seconds to midnight, because they're looking at the world. Russia, Ukraine, throw some earthquakes into it. How about some balloons that are flying over our airspace that we know nothing about, right? Like, all of a sudden now, everyone's like, "Ah!" (laughs) right? And the atomic scientists are like, yep. It's coming, global destruction, right? And they're all like smiling by the doomsday clock. And I'm going, you know what? I can can look, that thing can be one second before midnight. If you have Jesus, there's no fear. There's no terror. There's no dread. There's a sense of, ooh, we're one second closer to him coming back. His kingdom reigning. Like, like, We forget what Jesus says to us, the little flock, right? He says, oh, you of little flock. Luke chapter 12. Why are you living paralyzed? 
don't you know that the Father has promised you the kingdom? Like, there is a greater reality that you ought to live in. Stop. Turn off the news. Stop watching the doomsday clock stuff. Stop binge watching whatever you're binge watching. And be anchored in the truths of all truths. And that is your hope that's found in the king and the blessings of his kingdom. God wants this for you right now. There's the message. Thank you. <laughs> have you been encouraged? Have you been, have you, is there, is there some sense of hope that's been instilled within you? Is, has God been glorified? Has Christ been, been lifted up? Because again, to come under his authority, to be a part of a, of a, of a realm that sometimes is just hard to describe, but yet you know it's, it's, it's there and it's true. Oh, I invite you into that. Taste and see that the Lord is good today. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's pray. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the gathering of your people. For the fact that we are gathered around a throne. And that is your throne. And that throne is occupied by a king and his name is Jesus. And he's seated because the work is done. And you're currently gathering all the enemies and placing them as a footstool under his feet. We are so grateful and, and put at ease knowing that the king has come. He's conquered sin, death, the grave. And now we who are in Christ have nothing to fear. We are not men and women without hope. But we are so hopeful. Because as we know, this world may fade away, but the word... The king, his kingdom will never fade away. Thank you for calling us into your, into your family. Thank you for calling us your sons and daughters. Thank you for allowing us to know a love beyond any earthly love, a hope beyond any earthly hope, peace beyond any earthly peace. Help us to live in that. Help us to rejoice daily that we know the king of kings. Help us to live extravagantly in the kingdom because that's what you've given us and we are partakers of. Lord, help us to look different. Help us to walk in a manner worthy of our calling in Christ Jesus so that we have opportunities to point others to the hope, the only hope that matters, and that's Jesus. Thank you for today. Be glorified in our lives and what we say and do. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Love you guys.